Ah, well, <laughs> now this is the scary bit. What scares this me most? This is the potential uh, third wave, isn't it, Robert? Well, this is the third wave. And I, yeah. I think we have a lot of unanswered questions, a lot of yeah. scary questions. On the left, you can see uh, just looking at a number of batches of mm. messenger RNA, looking at the DNA contamination. They've all yeah. got some. Uh, yeah. This is coming from the, from the mechanism of producing it, uh, from the, 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 um, the, the cells that are making yeah. the, the RNA. The e. Um, e. coli uh, DNA, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's coming from, the, uh, yeah. Um, from, from the, the E. coli or whatever bacteria they're using. Yeah. Um, in the middle, it's just to remind us that we now know quite clearly that uh, the old adage that certainly we're all taught at university is that the DNA information goes to RNA, goes to protein. So you actually translate the, the genetic information, the coding, into yeah. the structure and function of proteins. Yeah. We now know quite clearly that the messenger RNA, which is supposed yeah. to be between the DNA and the protein, as you can see on this uh, graph, can yeah. actually reverse and yeah. put its message back into genomic yeah. DNA. Yeah. And that is scary. Uh, it's been found recently in a number of cancers. Uh, the expression of spike protein, which must can only come from a genetic base, uh, and, and that, of course, uh, is the messenger RNA that these people have had. Mm -hmm. there, there was a very scary one I saw this week where a, a woman uh, in her 80s had had something like nine messenger RNA vaccines, and I think it was six weeks after she had a stable breast cancer, uh, she started getting secondaries in her skin, which I would have thought is pretty uncommon in breast cancer. But uh, I'm not a. I, I'm I've, not I've a, never. I've, I've never seen it. I, I you know, I, I'm unaware of people getting. Yeah. And this, this woman started getting all these secondaries in her skin, and they biopsied it, and in the nucleus of the cancer cells and the cytoplasm, so both the inside and the outside parts of the cells, they found spike protein. Now that's. That's really, you know, it, it's an observation. You know, we, yeah. we can't prove anything from that, but it certainly asks questions that require answers. Yeah, yeah the central dogma well, the of last, DNA is, uh, is changed. Yeah. The, the, the last of third of this particular slide, it's not a very good picture, but it's the best I could do. Yeah. Um, you can see a sort of blue staining. It's a, a pancreatic cancer. They're a very yeah. interesting study from a, a, a group that sees a lot of pancreatic cancers. And what they found was that in the correlating with the period when vaccines were rolled out was a big increase in incidence of pancreatic cancer. Now, other people have described that. But what they found was that in a number of the cancers with pancreas, there was evidence of immune suppression of the response to COVID from the yeah. too much vaccination. Yeah. And when they looked at the cancer, this is a, a section of the pancreatic cancer, those little brown spots are T regulation cells. These are the yeah. suppressor cells that are responsible for turning off immunity. And they only found, they found that in the cancers that had the uh, evidence of this uh, vaccine related immune, presumed vaccine related immune suppression, the survival was only half that of the ones that had not had this same, and it turned out to be the number of vaccinations. If you had three or more vaccinations, you lived half as long as the ones who had less than three vaccinations. So this is consistent with the idea of the increased vaccinations, down-regulating the immune system, exhibiting, exactly. cro exhibiting cross immunity to reduce resistance to pancreatic cancer. Uh, and this is the first direct evidence that that might yeah. in fact be exactly what's happening. That is, that is, yeah, that is pretty frightening. Very frightening. Yeah. Now this is, I think, my last slide. I love this slide, yeah. John, because it tells a story. Now, I, I don't know uh, Kylie Wag stuff. I'd love to meet her, and if she ever watches this, uh, she's always welcome to have a cup of tea if she comes from Melbourne to Sydney. Now, I've got to be careful because Monash is where I did my PhD, and yeah. I'm not sure if you can take a PhD back, but... Monash has been behaving uh, a, a little bit, um, little bit interestingly, shall we say. Uh, Kylie Wagstaff was the woman who first showed that ivermectin killed the virus. Uh, she is a world expert on ivermectin and viral illness. And in 2020, I think it was very early in about April, 
she came out showing this was highly effective. And in fairness to Kylie, she said, look, you know, we need to do proper clinical studies. Well, the university clamped down on her like a ton of bricks. And all of a sudden, nothing was heard, nothing was happening. Um, uh, the, I, I love this quote from, uh, uh, we have this uh, newspaper, it's not one of our better ones, but it's called the Sydney Morning Herald. On the 22nd of October, 21, so yeah, right in the middle of all the scary times, uh, this came out. And the heading was, How a False Science Cure Became Australia's Contribution to the COVID Pandemic. <laughs> And this was the sort of nonsense that was going on. I, 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 re I actually remember seeing this and I, I really felt for Kylie Wagstaff because yeah. uh, she was really being suppressed. And now, what we didn't know is that Kylie was doing the right thing. Yeah. She was doing a little tiny randomised controlled trial of her own. Now, I, I assume she began that way back in 2020 when she had uh, uh, the handle on this ivermectin. But in the meantime... Uh, we suddenly find grants of huge millions of dollars going to Monash University from the government and from um, Moderna, the, the company that makes messenger RNA vaccines. And here's a picture of the head of Moderna in Australia and representative of Monash University shaking hands over the world's first MRA, messenger RNA, university commercial collaboration. Mm. And that tree is actually $3 million that went to the university. Now... Isn't that interesting? So what should we see? I think it's, uh, uh, is it September? I think, yeah, September of this year, Kylie publishes her little randomised controlled trial yeah. where she was giving, um, it was a very small study. Uh, there were, I think there was only about 60 or so uh, uh, people, but they were people closely associated with someone who got COVID. And they yeah. were given just one, just one capsule of ivermectin, just one. 12 milligrams, and presumably. Yeah. 12 milligrams. But it, yeah. it was on a weight basis, but it was average yeah. around about 12 yeah. milligrams. And guess what? Even in this tiny, weeny study, the, and it was beautifully done, everything was done correctly, there was a highly significant, highly significant, in uh, with small numbers. Uh, there wasn't enough numbers to know if you had less infections, like we showed in the hydroxychloroquine uh, study, but it was de significantly delayed and it was much shorter. In other words, it was not nearly as severe. So here we are, one ivermectin tablet done by the inventor of, well, the, the first person who showed ivermectin was very effective, yeah. who'd been squashed and controlled for five, five years, suddenly publishing her little study, which I guess she did on her classmates or the people around her because the numbers were pretty small. Um, I, I mean, good on you, Kylie. Um, yeah. I, I'm so sorry that uh, uh, it was published in a pretty obscure journal and um, probably no one else other than me is going to give you the credit for it. But uh, look what happened in the meantime um, with her university. I mean, it really is a disgrace, isn't it? Well, it's always good to see some funding going into academia, Robert. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Oh, dear me. Yeah. So just to put all of this together, which is, you know, I just picked these out as, as the issues that I thought that came out of our book that uh, were important. The, the yeah. first is that the genetic vaccines have never, ever been shown to have any advantage over the good old traditional yeah. antigen vaccines, which, of course, were used in China. Uh, an Australian one was developed, but, of course, was banned in Australia, and it was used in uh, Iran. Iran. Yeah. Iran yeah. had the advantage of an Australian vaccine, which yeah. is very good. Um, they're no better. And in fact, the early evidence suggests they're not as good yeah. uh, as the Korean study in young boys. Yeah. Um, and, and where we're at is this cusp of tolerance. And I say it's the elephant in the room. Uh, something you're not seeing with the antigen vaccines because you control the dose with the yeah. antigen vaccines. You can't control the dose with yeah. the genetic vaccines. I tried to describe the adverse events in my view, as three overlapping waves, yep. one due to T-cell attack on a foreign protein expressed yep. by many and many cells. So that's the uh, myocarditis, the pericarditis. Myocarditis is a classic, and recently that's been uh, actually shown to be truly autoimmune because um, there's uh, an overlap, a similarity in sequence uh, yep. of amino acids. 
between the spike protein uh, and some of the cardiac proteins. Yes. Which is quite a, very like rheumatic fever, actually, John. Yeah. Uh, where streptococcus cross-reacts with the M protein, I think it is on streptococcus, yeah. cross-reacts with cardiac tissue. You've got a, sim uh, a similar shaped molecule on part of the spike protein yeah. and yeah. a very similar shaped molecule on part of the, of the heart, yeah, myocardium confused, or pericardium. Yeah. It, attack, it attacks yeah. uh, the good, the good yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, and then there's the systemic inflammation, which is classically the post-COVID uh, vaccine syndrome, yeah. uh, characterized by fatigue, brain fog, POTS syndrome. And what they also get is a burning feet syndrome due to small fiber neuropathy. Very, yes. very common. Very Horrible common. symptom. Horrible. And it correlates with the POTS. I, I think it's the small fiber, small fiber uh, nerves are attacked mm. uh, and it possibly related to some autoimmune issues. Yeah, we've we interviewed a few people on the channel. Brianne Dressing springs to mind, and, and she's yeah. just had, yeah. you know, she, she describes her life as rolling in prickly cactus all the time. Oh, it's, it's terrible. Just One of my friends terrible. and neighbours, yeah, who I think, I think you met, actually, uh, she yeah. got burning feet, burning hands, and I had yeah. a patient last week who also had a burning tongue um, from, from the same thing. Horrible. Uh, and, of course, the early studies on dementia are scary and the yeah. early studies on cancer, they're red flags. We, we, yeah. we can't prove, well, we can only associate at the moment. Yeah. And, yeah. and we want people to really do more work and wave those red flags and investigate yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I pointed out that the repurposed drugs are better than the expensive yeah. <laughs> antivirals. Yeah. We'll say no more. Yeah. I was very keen to talk about post-COVID vaccine syndrome as being of similar nature and equal incidence uh, as the long COVID, which we now call either post-COVID syndrome or post-COVID infection syndrome. 10% uh, of vaccinations are leading to some level of this syndrome. And I tried to point out that in many, if not most of these patients, uh, there is treatment that can be highly effective. Yeah. Uh, and I, I just wanted to finish with saying what I thought the great danger is as we look to the future. The great danger and the unique aspect of this pandemic compared with every other pandemic we've had in Australia is that we haven't learnt. We have not learnt. We've had a series of uh, government-inspired uh, uh, in, uh, re reports and investigations, and each and every one of them uh, have been disgraceful. Um, the second thing is that my profession, medical profession, uh, is shifting uh, to a government control. We, we aren't making the decisions at a patient level. Yeah. Uh, that the, the great strength of the profession has been that we've made decisions with a patient and yeah. we've made them on science. Yeah. And what COVID has done has laid bare, yeah. probably an evolving phenomenon that's been going on for some time. So yeah. that's my five points, yeah. John. Yeah. Doctors aren't allowed to be doctors and they're not allowed to establish oh, concordance like with, with, with yeah, their yeah. patients anymore. That's true. Yeah. Robert, that is such a brilliant summary. Um, thank you, as always. And uh, <clears throat> we certainly look forward to doing the, 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 the next paper that you're working on. I wish I had half of your energy. I really do. Um, well, you're putting twice mine, John. You <laughs> if only. And the book, of course. Well, I, I tell you one other thing that, that I don't think I've had a chance to tell you. Mm. Oh, yes, I have, because you've written something for it. Um, as you know, and some of the Australian people watching this might yeah. know, um, I, I've been very uh, impressed by uh, Quadrant, which is a, yeah. uh, it's probably a centre-right sort of uh, journal, which is pretty appropriate for people over the age of 50. Um, <laughs> But it, it's it's very pretty good. appropriate for anyone who's a clear thinker. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they've published twelve of my articles through the COVID yeah, period, yeah, yeah, yeah. and each article's looked at what I saw as issues of the day, yeah. and and they're putting the twelve together. I've written a prologue and an epilogue, and John's written a very nice introduction, uh, yeah. as has Peter McCullough from from yep. America, yep. Uh, and so Peter and John have written an introduction, and they're bringing this out as a small book before Christmas, uh, so. Um, I, I never mind saying nice things about Quadrant because uh, it's a well-kept secret. It's a terrific, uh, terrific journal on a whole range of, of issues, uh, yeah. and it's been incredibly supportive of the, the truth um, in, uh, um, I in COVID. Uh, they've got a, an ex-Prime Minister as the chairman of the board. Uh, it's, it's, it's certainly not a dodgy 
journal. It's a high quality, high class journalistic effort. Yep. No, and we'll certainly put links to, to all of these things. Excellent. Um, Robert, as always, thank you so much on behalf of my audience, but, but, but on behalf of the human race, really, for what you're doing. You know, you're bringing things to light that otherwise would be suppressed by who, know, who knows which alternative powers. So, as always, thank you so much. John, as always, it's such a pleasure to, to talk with you. Yeah, it's really important stuff. Yeah, thank you.